for the, inviting me to for the talk. Um, I think um, after what we heard about the renal and the advances that we'll see in um, nephrology and uh, microscopic, uh, you know, neurosurgery, cardiac surgery, I stand here in front of you with the most I can do is skin prick testing. I feel a little bit awkward about it. However, there's a catch to that because all these illnesses are not as common as allergy. Allergy, one in four children now suffer from allergy. So 25%, whatever the illnesses you mentioned, all together they will not reach the allergy. Allergy is the next pandemic and something what we have to look after. And we have to have the resources and the ability to deal with them. Okay, so these two photos. What is common in between these two photos? Sorry? Okay, uh, no. No, there's a trick. There's a trick. This is not express breast milk, by the way. Okay, so I'll tell you because we don't have time. So the common thing between these things is actually creature mom feeding their children a different milk from different creature. Do you agree? Okay, but the other thing I want to tell you, how common do you see the first photo? How common do you see that photo? Very common. What's the percentage now in the UK of breastfeeding at the age of six weeks? Any idea? 50? Down? 15? No, up. <laughs> it's around 30%. It's around 30%. And there was a lot of work done, basically, on that. And believe it or not, despite 10, 10 of millions of pounds spent, they did not increase it because simply they are targeting the wrong population. Anyway, but coming back to see this, to these photos, um, if you look at, do you think animals will have food allergy? Do you think animals will have food allergy? Yes. Anaphylaxis in animals? Yes. Atopic dermatitis in animals? Yes. yes, they do. But the chance of that is extremely low. And do you know what animals will get that? Where's animal common? Yes. Domesticated animals. So. Animals in the wild, they don't get food allergy. They don't get, the, basically, dermatitis, atopic dermatitis. And I'm not a very good statistician, but I have a very close friend of mine, Professor William Tarnordi, who sat with, in Sydney the very last time I was there, and we tried to play with the numbers. So if you compare the incidence of allergy and correlate that to the different type of feeding, you see a very close correlation. If you feed your children, or babies, particularly a different antigen from day one that your body will reject, you will increase substantially the food allergy. So the message is basically for food allergy, it's common, it's important, and we can do a few things, minor things, and we can change it. Particularly, look, if you look at the breastfeeding, it's very well correlated to reduce incidence of different type of allergies. Um, uh, but to be realistic, I think what I advise, it's at least for the first three months. And after that, the benefit to prevent allergy can drop sharply. But at least for the first three months, it has to be, um, you know, breastfeeding exclusive. Okay, so this is what's happening now. Actually, the food allergy, not only the food allergy, but acute reaction to food allergy is in the rice. Okay, and you can see the anaphylaxis. And what's interestingly, the commonest now causing, what's the commonest thing causing anaphylaxis now? Commonest food? Sorry? Peanut? Any others? Milk. The commonest cause of anaphylaxis, food that causes anaphylaxis is actually milk. It's not the peanut. Okay? One thing, I mean, as again, so I want to give you some good news about it. Our basically uh, management of the allergy of anaphylaxis or acute reaction is actually improving vastly. So you can see the morbidity and mortality actually uh, is decreasing significantly. One thing, remember, the mortality from food allergy hits the news because usually these are a very healthy, well basically patients who went and by mistake took something and ended up in that. I mean, there are crazy stories from the UK and from Australia where a 14-year-old was in the middle of nowhere in the bus who tried to show how her, basically she is a brave in front of her friends who took a bar of Snicker and had the EpiPen or the adrenaline auto-injector 
and took the sneaker or Mars and hit herself basically with adrenaline. Unfortunately, this girl died. So basically, the death from an anaphylaxis is not that high, but it hits the news. Anyway, so let's go for some cases then. 18 month old, sudden eruption of urticaria and swelling of the lips after eating peanuts. Is this anaphylaxis or not? Anaphylaxis or not? No? How, how many anaphylaxis? Hands up, please. Anaphylaxis. Okay, fine. Well, you have three different definitions of anaphylaxis. You have the American, you have the European, and you have the British. Okay? But this is, I will regard that as anaphylaxis. And best just be on the safe side, and you have to manage it. Okay, sorry, it's adrenaline auto injector uh, given, and IgE for peanut was 27. That's high. So, management, any idea? Okay, avoid all nuts. Why all nuts? Contamination sometimes. Sometimes, to be on the safe side, basically. Dietitian support, get a dietitian sometimes, although it's not common in peanuts, and review in 16, 18 months. Okay, 18 months, we see her, no comorbidity for the child, repeat IgE, it's going down significantly below what we do the challenge, and food challenge, we did it, no reaction, advise her to go and get peanuts, basically, regularly, because anything, if you don't take it regularly, there is a chance that you might have it again. Okay, so that's uh, straightforward. And then, a four-month-old with worsening eczema, since starting the formula milk, some blood on the stool, maternal history of eczema, by the way, the most correlated things with allergy is maternal history of eczema. And then, no growth concern, treatment, Extensively hydrolyzed formula, if we can, we have to support it apart from breast milk. Dietitian support, basically exclusion, we worry about the calcium intake, about protein sometimes. And milk ladder, possibly at the age of, um, you know, one year. And uh, introducing gradually, there are different types of milk ladders, there's even homemade milk ladders. So, a piece of cake, isn't it, the allergy, practicing allergy? But stop, this is not the cases, this is cases you see it only in textbook. You do not see these cases. These are basically, possibly there are a few like the second scenarios, but we don't see these cases in the, in the book. I had a patient uh, three weeks ago, an expat, who sat with her husband for 40 my, 45 minutes trying to convince me that her daughter is allergic to water. I honestly. Unfortunately, the husband wasn't taking any of it, but she wanted to report it as the first case of allergy to water. So these are the case scenarios that we face. I had another case, something like three, four months ago, who's saying basically, my child has anaphylaxis to sugar, and we know sugar is a carbohydrate, and if you are allergic, you're really allergic to the protein. Anyway, these are the cases, but I will go through some cases only from the last month. So this is a five-month-old infant, absolutely fine, breastfeeding, no significant family of atopy, and the mom walked into the clinic. It's my time to introduce uh, solid, I want allergy test before I introduce any solids. What will you do? Okay, so no risk. You don't have to do it. You're breastfed. There's nothing. I always tell them it is innocent till proven otherwise rather than guilty till proven otherwise. Introduce her. I ask her basically even to be on the careful side. Just do it carefully and start avoidance of antigens and basically of food that causes allergy will increase the chance allergy based on the LEAP study, and we know that very well. So I thought she left the clinic happy. But of course, a few weeks later, same lady in the clinic, someone else did the IgE test for her. And here she's giving me the investigations, and of course, but in between, she spoke to uh, Professor Google, who is the world expert in uh, pediatric food allergy, and coming with certain things, basically, in her mind. How can I do? What do you want me to do? Okay, so there are some positives here. What should I do? Can I ask, what will you do in your practice? So let me just... Okay, what will you do? Any suggestion? There's a very, a very worried mom sitting in the front of the clinic to tell you, my child is allergic. And the issue here, you don't know what other doctors already told her. 
So what's the expectations? Did they tell her like that? I don't want to basically. Sometimes even if you say the same thing in different wording, it will be misinterpreted. Okay. And what if this child, you know, we are human beings. I know it's not high, and we know the IgE does not detect allergy. It detects sensitization. So, but yes, and so you have something which is two or wheat class three. If I give this child class three wheat and it has anaphylaxis, what will happen? Any suggestion? First of all, do not stop any food based on the blood test. If the child is taking that blood test, I wouldn't stop any food based on that. We do have to be on the careful side when there is high risk, so comorbidities, significant family histories, and I've seen different people doing it differently. Remember, there are a lot of other limitations in this country, so basically insurance. Some of the insurance, they don't pay for the test if you pay for it. And the other things, some um, other places, it's not always available to do. And, you know, at the drop of a hat, you can do food challenges or you can basically admit them in the hospital. So I've seen different people doing it differently, but you have to adjust your own practice to your settings and do it the way you think. It's the best for your patients. Okay, and this is basically, as I say, this is what usually comes, but re remember, that doesn't mean a lot. It doesn't mean... I mean, one of the interesting things, I checked my blood once for allergy and for milk, I am on class three, okay? But I take milk every day, I took milk just now. Should I stop taking milk? No. And you can see, I don't talk about the skin prick testing a lot because we do it, but still not, that, uh, not the way we used to do it in Australia. We have much higher. Okay, so, so as I said, basically, the first, when I sit with this, you, don't, you want to tell our patient, so what did other, what's, what do you think is happening here? Okay, for the parents. And unfortunately, sometimes the parents, they don't come forward. So possibly my colleague tell them the same thing. But they don't come forward with what's happening. That's number one. And what's their expectation? Are they expecting me to stop it completely? And that's what most of the family will do, even regardless of what you advise them. Are, are they going to do it? One of the moms brought a, basically a child, and she said, okay, you're telling me there's no problem, but I'm going to bring a, a, a toast. I'm sitting, I'm sitting in front of the clinic. I'm going to give him toast there. And if anything happens, I'll bring him directly to the clinic. So these are the scenarios that we regularly face. And how do we take it for forward? So in, in principle, I think in my practice, in um, low risk, uh, with no, basically, evidence of allergy, it is innocent to the proven otherwise. Okay, second case is a three-year-old, basically, child who went to school and he's got eczema in the past, but certainly, the, over the last four to six months, it looks like his eczema start to worsen. And someone, basically, told them that this is likely to be food-related and go to the doctor to see whether they can find the, the, the trigger for that. Any idea? What should we do? It's a very straightforward, no family histories, eczema, a child who started school. Okay, so one thing I think from the practice, and if you look at the figures, late eczema after the age of two years, it's unlikely to be food related. Okay, just put that. Eczema, you can see the allergic march. The food allergy, the eczema-related or type 4 allergy is usually before. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm saying it's usually after the age of, uh, before the age of two years. So eczema is very unlikely. And I'm quite basically, sometimes in these scenarios, you can do it, basically, exclusion diet, particularly with type food allergy. You can sit, uh, basically, the commonest allergen. Okay, communist allergy, and you can do it. Uh, um, I will have to ask one question. So if you have two children, one has an egg allergy, anaphylaxis, and the other one has allergy to kiwi, and you are allowed to do one IgE to one of them, which one you will choose? Okay. Which one? So do we do, first of all, let's agree, do we do IgE for the first presentation? Is it a must? Do we need it? Usually, no, the history is much clearer, but it might be relevant when you come back later on to revisit that child 
because we know the common foods, we know what's the level or the threshold under which you can do safely the, uh, the food challenge. However, there are certain foods that we don't know what is it. And what you can, in these scenarios, that's why I'm saying kiwi, which is becoming common, tomato is becoming common. That's what I say basically, these are the ones that I choose because if it is high, I will repeat it and monitoring the drop in it might help me to decide when should I do the food challenge or whether I will do this food challenge. So, so limitation in practice, as I said, uh, mainly investigations, not all the insurance cover the investigations, not only insurance cover the skin prick testing. That is particularly relevant when you need to come back and do actually the food challenge because you don't want to do it blindly. The second thing, pediatric dietitian. I don't know how many of you have a pediatric dietitian who are well versed in food allergy. I don't have one. And we have been trying basically for the last 18 months to get a one who is basically well versed in gastro. We compromise to say we need in gastro and food allergy. We're still looking for that. It's been more than 18 months. Food challenges, it's always a, you know, you need to justify it because it is a resource intensive uh, process. You need a dietitian, you need a nurse, you need to do it in certain scenarios when you have a PICU in case if you go to the anaphylaxis. Those are the things. And awareness basically of the normal food allergy, the awareness of the investigation, rule of investigation in food allergy. Um, I think um, we are moving more to consider low home challenges for different foods. Eggs, we started with milk, it's now with egg, but remember, you have to screen this patient very carefully and explain the situation uh, how to do it. We need to rationalize the investigations when you don't have an insurance, open check from insurance to do it. And IgE versus skin prick testing, this is a common and sometimes we, can, we have to use them together um, and justify it basically uh, for the insurance in this part of the world. And we have basically, that we are in uh, the Australia, at the moment looking at the less work intensive, labor intensive food challenges because usually when I worked in the UK, they want to do certain numbers in case someone, but that in case didn't happen that frequently. So how to challenge, so I'm working on the, um, uh, on the different other foods, home challenges. But please don't do it as DIY or do it yourself because that is very dangerous things to do in some cases. Thank you very much.